Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Caleb Brown. Joining us today is Wolf von Lehr. He is the CEO of Students for Liberty. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thank you so much for having me. Let me start by telling us what is Student for Liberty? First of all, I would like to say thank you to the Cato Institute, not only for hosting me, but also Students for Liberty was incubated in your very halls here. So we are now 10 years old, but we got started off here in your offices. So um, you provide a lot of support initially, and now we are a $3.9 million organization. To answer your question, uh, Students for Liberty is a worldwide active organization that focuses on empowering the next generation of leaders of liberty. What does that mean? So we are really reaching out to students here in the United States and across the world who are interested in classical liberal libertarian thoughts, the thinking that the Cato Institute um, embraces as well. And once we identified these people, we're going to train them more in like how to do advocacy, how to be a good libertarian, but also how to reach out to others and organize events. So just last year alone, we had 98 conferences all around the world with 20,000 attendees. And we do this again over the $3.9 billion uh, million dollar budget. And uh, we are now active on all inhabited continents. But we started here in the United States and the main focus is still on the United States because we are here in the land of the free and we're working very hard to uh, continue to make it there. You're relatively new to the CEO position, right? That's right. Um, it's uh, only been six months and it has been a wild ride, but I enjoy it very much so far. And how did you get involved in SFL then? And then get to where you are. Yeah. So we incorporated here in the United States in 2008. In 2011, you know, um, Students for Liberty went for the first time abroad. So it was an experiment and they started off in Europe. And I was one of the people who applied for the executive board position because everything what we do is basically volunteer led. All of the 98 conferences that I was talking about are organized, are lo- operated and led by our volunteers. And so I applied for the position and I got into it. And then suddenly I found myself in the room with Alexander McCobin, the founder of the organization, and incredible students from all around Europe who had so much more knowledge than I had, who knew so many different movements in different countries in Europe. And I I felt a little bit intimidated uh, when I was there at the Institute for Economic Affairs. And the one and there was sitting Hayek at the table. On the other hand, it was uh, Ayn Rand. And these people were talking about things that I didn't really know about. But I quickly learned that the organization trusts young people and trusted me. And so I became very active. I uh, raised over 50,000 euros to start the first training program in Europe and organized conferences with several hundred attendees and later became the chairperson. What do you view as some of the biggest challenges that you face on campuses, both in the United States and around the world? So the answer would differ, of course, depending on the country we are talking about. So we currently, we have a leader with the name Jan uh, imprisoned in Venezuela because he stood up for the ideas of liberty and continued so as an alumni of our, alumnus of our programs. So they face like much harsher condition we do here in the United States. But if you're talking about the US, um, I mean, you know very well about the free speech issue on campus. You have been working on that as well. So that is certainly an issue. And we are reaching out to both uh, the left and the right to, to really address that and form coalitions and talk about the importance of these ideas. Besides that, um, I think the current generation is really ready. They are sick of the left-right dichotomy about butting heads of the Republicans with the Democrats. And our message really resonates with them because we are not going on campus and trying to yell at them. We are trying to understand where they're coming from. And then once we understood where they're coming from, trying to tell them, okay, maybe we have like similar goals. We all want to live like in a prosperous, more just, more equal society, but we have different means. Let's talk about that instead of just being in their face. And I think the, especially in the United States, people are ready for that message. How hard is it to communicate this message or to get a sizable group of students for liberty on a college campus now? I mean, it's, I've been, it's been quite a while since I've been in college um, and when I was there, I was in a very leftist college um, in Boulder, Colorado, but it seemed – I mean, I I never got a sense that like the, the university itself was mobilized against these ideas. It was – it felt pretty welcoming and open. Um, has that – has that changed? Is it – you know, so you talk about the, the free speech on campus issues, which we hear a lot of anecdotes about, but it's hard from – not being on a college campus to see how really pervasive that is, how much that's become kind of a culture among young people. Is there a strong like anti-liberty culture that you have to push back against? Sometimes we do experience that. So students of ours basically nearly got fined because they were handing out the constitution. 
the very version that the K2 Institute produces. So we were handing that on, out on campus, our students, and they got really a lot of trouble into that because that well, was not like... Because people were offended by Roger Pallon's intro. It wasn't the Constitution <laughs> itself that was the problem. No, I, I think it was just like doing this because it said, this is not like a dedicated zone where you can do that. Please stop refraining from doing this. So, I mean, many universities are public institutions, so the, the amendments should also apply to these places. So this is, of course, deeply upsetting. But it doesn't happen uh, too often. And and of, of course, sometimes when you have like controversial topics, so we, for instance, had like a single issue campaign once on free market environmentalism. So they talked about how the free market actually benefits um, the environment and how it has become much better. And your human progress center here also has a lot of very informative data on that. And the speaker was there and suddenly there was like a bunch of very hardcore leftist groups who were shouting down the speakers and we had the student leaders then had to call uh, the police. Similarly, we also face this from the right. Like in Serbia, we had an event about like decriminalization of drugs and suddenly like right wing groups came in there, like neo-Nazis who were spitting at our students, which was like outrageous. But in both cases, our students remain calm and just like um, try to get like this situ situation in control and try not like to escalate it further. And we sometimes have to face that. But generally, these are the exceptions. Normally, as long as we talk to people in a friendly manner and also try to reach out to, to the left and the right on the campus beforehand when we have an event, that works very well. How much overlap is there between uh, Students for Liberty and uh, overt political activism? That is to say, going out, going out and supporting candidates or opposing other candidates. Yeah, so we have a 501c3 organization. So we refrain from taking any like uh, policy stance or in, in, in supporting any candidates. So we cannot do that and we don't do that. Um, so I would say that we have a very heterogeneous set of students who are interested in academia, in journalism, in becoming business people, but also in becoming politicians. So we certainly talk about that and we talk about that this is one of the means of spreading the ideas of liberty. And in this country, Ron Paul was very formative and even internationally, Ron Paul was very formative for many classical liberals or libertarians. And so many of our people go on into politics. So you might have seen how much impact had we in Brazil. So we not only talk about the Brazil, we also get a lot of stuff done. So you saw these massive, massive um, events on the streets where people were protesting and many of them were holding signs up like less Marx, more Mises, um, in Portuguese, of course. And there was a whole classical liberal movement there. And many of these people now who we have trained as a part of our leadership are now like in state parliaments. Sure, they're not part of our organization anymore, but they are our alumni and they are still affecting change this way too. So we do not prevent that and many of our people are going to do that, but we do not focus only on politicians like some other organizations. In Brazil, uh, Kim Kataguri is one of the people who figures prominently there. Fabio Osterman was mm -hmm. another one and were largely uh, instrumental in organizing those large protests that ended with Dilma Youssef being ousted uh, from office. Uh, there are people here and I think there are even people in Brazil who count themselves as being among the, the libertarian ranks who were incredibly surprised at the robustness of the student movement in Brazil. Can you speak to that at all in terms of where that came from? Yeah, so Fabio is a, is a friend of mine and uh, Kim has also been working with us. So we were really in the forefront. We're not the only organization who's working on, on Brazilian issues. So they have like a very robust landscape of think tanks, uh, etc. But I think it was a combination of that we really had the the right approach and it was just also the time. They were sick of so many decades of cronyism and leftist populist uh, policies there and they were just sick of it. And so we were there with the right people, with the right training and the right ideas. And so I think it was just uh, the timing that also really were played into that. However, now it has been a year basically since many of these events happened. Um, Dilma Rousseff was uh, ousted more recently, but we still have like a huge demand for our programs. We just trained last year uh, several uh, hundreds of them, like, close to a thousand, and that's, that interest continues. So it's not like a fluke um, as far as I can tell, but um, if we can sustain that momentum, that is a good question and we have to look into that and we are improving our programs constantly to be uh, still being attractive to these uh, students. What does this training look like? What do you do to help 
student advocates become better advocates for liberty? Yeah. So it really depends what we're talking about because we have like a leadership pipeline. So we invest more visas in the people who are the most active. But if you talk about the first step, one of the basic tenets of us is uh, learning about our status as 51C3, what they can do, what they cannot do, about the history of the organization. But more interestingly, we are talking about persuasion how we as classical liberal can get the ideas of liberty across in a better way, that we are not going to yell at other people, that we're trying to understand where they're coming from. Because you can see so much activism, if you want to call it that way, on Facebook where people are just like writing angry comments all day, all, all night. And that is not very productive. So we have a different approach and we're trying to make young people realize that this is not the best way of going about it, but they should be like friendly, kind and understanding. And I think that works much better because when I discovered the ideas of liberty, I was um, that was in the after the financial crisis, the Great Recession, and I became very passionate when I was reading Hayek and Mises and Rothbard and people like that. And I thought I found the truth, and many young people feel that way. It's like an ex it's an exciting worldview, and then sometimes they become like so ingrained in this that they just see everything in black and white. And and I certainly have um, I think pushed people away from the ideas, and it's the last thing that I want to do. So I've learned from my mistakes, and we're trying to, to really um, yeah, push it forward. But we also talk about fundraising and project management because everything that we do, the 90 conferences, our media to a large extent, is driven by our volunteers. So they have to learn how to an event with several hundred people. And they're learning really, really valuable skills doing that. And I can honestly say, without Students for Liberty, I would not have a fraction of the skills that I have today. I have to learn much more. I know. I'm still young. But... Most parents tell their kids what they should be doing. Most universities tell kids what they should be doing. We believe in them that they can do great things. And we see that every week. Just recently, one of our uh, so-called local coordinators, one of our volunteers, was on French national television quoting Frédéric Bastiat and defending Uber. These are kids who are like 22 years, 23 years old. And he's not an outlier. We have thousands of these. And they really have a huge impact for the ideas of liberty because we trust them and they come up with their own programs and ideas. I, th I think it's actually just a hazard of being a young person where if you are aware of something that you believe to be the truth, you are uh, perhaps a little more brusque with people than you ought to be. What would you tell young people who are interested in uh, spreading the ideas of liberty to avoid engaging in that kind of uh, uh, turning people off? What to avoid is basically when you talk to someone, our natural incl inclination, inclination uh, not only for young people but for everyone, is always to respond and give like counter arguments. That somebody's talking and like everyone gives me like a very good argument right now why the minimum wage is the best thing ever. And like I'm already thinking about all the arguments I would have against that point. And one should try to observe one's mind and if you're doing that and try to overcome that. So just trying to listen first and understanding where the other party is coming from. And if you do that first, I think that's the most important step because then the other party, let, let's say you're talking to a left winger, realize that you're actually listening to them, that you understand them. And um, there's this wonderful saying, and I'm probably butchering that, but you, we should strive for that we can articulate the ideas of the other side, right wing or left wing, better than they ever could. We should be striving for that and because that really means that we understand where they're coming from, that we understand the arguments, and then, and only then, it is really useful to talk about our approach and our ideas because then the other side would listen more. And that goes back to like things from Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people, which is like standard reading for us and in, like training on emotional intelligence, which we're trying to incorporate more and more in our programs. How much do you encourage then your, the people in this leadership pipeline or the people you're working with in training to learn about the ideas of the other side? This is one of the things that I have noticed so we have interns come through here and, and the work that I do with libertarianism.org, um, I spend these amount of time talking to people who are new to libertarianism and there's often this attitude of, you know, I found the truth in Mises and Hayek and Rothbard and Bastiat and, you know, those guys knew what they were talking about. Um, and so why should I spend time really reading, you know, the people that I disagree with? Um, that you get this. You get this from this a lot from kids who've gotten big into objectivism. That you know, I've I've read Ayn Rand, so I don't really need to read John Rawls or mm -hmm. any of those um, anti-human philosophers. Um, so is that something? Do you is it how important do you think it is to really learn those foundations of the beliefs that 
you may think are out to lunch? So it is it is absolutely crucial, but it really depends also on the preferences of the students. So we do not encourage all of our students to become like perfect academics. So if you are just are there because you're part of the community and you, you happen to really like the ideas and you want to organize some social events where you gather with other people and talk about the ideas, that is totally fine. But the people who really want to get out there and want to talk with other people, I think they quickly learn that they need to do that. Because once you're actually listening to someone else and n do not stay only in your echo chamber of like libertarian groups and organizations, then you quickly learn that they also have sometimes very sophisticated ideas. So one of the first things that I did when I came here, free speech is not such an issue in, in Europe compared to the United States right now on campus at least. The first thing that I did, I was reading people from the Frankfurt School, like what kind of arguments they had. And I was shocked to see that unfortunately the arguments are quite logically coherent. They're misguided, and I think they have the wrong approach, but they're logically coherent. And that's the only way how I could approach people on, on campus and try to engage with them. Because if you're just like in their face and just like say like, oh, you have to believe in the constitution and in free speech, it's not a value of theirs. And if you don't understand that from the get-go, you will never be able to communicate to other people. And we are filtering our people very selectively. We go for quality over quantity. Um, I want people in our organization who have a good knowledge and understanding of the ideas, but who are also kind human beings. Because that's how you like form a community which is also attractive to others. Because there's so many other groups out there um, which are very hostile and they work on an anti-left mentality or the left is working on an anti-right mentality. And that's not how you're building bridges and that's not how you get more people excited about the idea which I truly believe have been changing the world and can make the world even better than it is today. In Europe and uh, and the United States, there has been the rise of, at least in the United States, it's called the alt-right. And in Europe, it is populist nationalist parties. In Spain, it's populist communist uh, party there. What, what do they have to offer in terms of a, a pitch for young people? And how do you evaluate the values of uh, libertarianism against that kind of uh, that argument that they make. Yeah, and we will this we we see this threat coming up in many many different countries. There's like Le Pen in in France as well, and the interesting thing is that this is always very, not very encouraging, right? Because we're saying like, oh, we're talking about classical liberal ideas for so many years. Why is it, why is so many people still are excited about populism? And uh, it is true, and what can you do? So even though that France has going such a, like let's talk about France for a second, has taken such a wide turn, it is also true that it has seen, and in France of all places, like a strong classical liberal movement. One of the major German newspapers was just uh, reporting about that, that young people really um, embrace these ideas. So um, I think the first thing is that we need, again, like the right people in place who are advocating for the ideas and then they stand up for, for like against this populism and people become sick of it. We see that with Trump, that people are like his, his approval is in, is in the basement, right? And people are ready for like a new message and the uh, left and right dichotomy doesn't work so well. So I think it's always like also an opportunity. But how to do this specifically? Um, I cannot give you one answer because we very much work with the Hayekian framework of decentralized knowledge and local knowledge. So we believe only that the leaders in France or in Brazil, that they have the right approach. And so we don't tell them what to do. We tell them what has worked in other countries and our 10 years of organizing stuff on campus all around the world. But we don't tell them how to approach it and how to engage with the public discourse in their specific country. Because we would otherwise also endanger them. Because if you use, for instance, the term free market, or capitalism in like some of the African countries that can get you in real trouble, and our students have been in trouble, even though they have have used like softer language. Where have been some of the strongest? You, we talked about Brazil, of mm -hmm. course, that's a, an obvious example. But specifically in Europe, where have we seen some of the biggest growth of classical liberal libertarian ideas in in Europe? The biggest growth of classical liberal ideas it, it's. It's in a bunch of countries and it's it's really striking. Like I've already alluded to to France, but when we started on the board, actually, we had like seven people sitting around and planning the future, how we're going to do this, organizing events. And we said like, oh, we're not going to touch France because nobody is libertarian there whatsoever. And and now it's like one of our strongholds there. Besides that, um, the Iberian Peninsula, they have nearly every week, they have a massive event with hundreds of people talking about very intellectual topics. They have a very strong leadership team there. Uh, Georgia, the country, is also very strong. 
And I was blown away by that when I read a report. So each time when they organized something, they write like an after action report. And they wrote 15 pages. And they had 500 people there for a one day event. They have been on a campus tour before to, to tell other people about that. They have been on television before this, talking about the event. They had Subway there, Coca-Cola, all kinds of spo corporate sponsors there. And they raised all their own money for this event. So we didn't have to pay like $1 of the money that we are raising here in the United States and also abroad. And so there's really like pockets of, of um, many pockets um, where we have like strong, strong leaders. Um, and also I would also say Latin America and Guatemala. Of course, we all know about the University Francisco Marroquin, but our leaders are organizing frequently events with like 300 people there just talking also to high school students. So um, there are many different countries uh, out there which are very strong. You mentioned Ron Paul earlier and he seemed to, it's a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my younger colleagues got involved in libertarianism because they got involved with Ron Paul's campaigns, but he's kind of dropped away from that. Um, Rand has always been an influence, but what sorts of are a lot of your students kids who grew up in libertarian homes and kind of it's just it's been in the water for them or what brought them into it in the first place? So if you talk about the United States specifically, it is still Ron Paul because people still see the videos and are still excited about that, but it, it is ebbing away. And we have seen that because we have been growing a lot in the United States and once Ron Paul was gone, we saw that our growth was not as dramatically anymore. So that's, that certainly has an effect if you have a public figure like that. Besides that, I think the network of institutions in this country is very strong. Like I've been, been alumnus of IHS of the Institute for Main Studies, of Mercators, and many other organizations out there. So many people are quoting that they have been influenced by them. And I mean, you're, you're working now on this podcast, and I'm sure many people will hear about libertarianism for the first time through your good work here. And that is also an answer to that. And I would say it's not very often that people really grow up in a libertarian household, because we still are very much a minority, even though growing. Um, but that is rarely the case. So we have in our organization, also on staff, both examples where people came from the very hardcore left, where people were reading Marx day in and day out, and then they discovered, okay, maybe it doesn't work. And then they studied Mises and the socialist calculation debate and saw suddenly like there's something else to this. and. Uh, learn more about that. For instance, we also had one leader in Venezuela again. Um, his name is Oscar. I don't want to go into detail, but <laughs> he grew up in a very poor neighborhood in Venezuela, even for Venezuelan standards. And he grew up very much committed to the ideas of Marxism. He was even teaching others until 2012 when he went to a conference that we organized about private solutions to public problems. And that was the first time that his worldview was challenged significantly. So he had to think a lot about that and he started studying more and he became part of our leadership. We trained him and now he is an Austrian economist. He's actually trained. He's uh, now working at the only classical liberal think tank in Venezuela and spreading the ideas of liberty not only there but throughout whole Latin America. But we also have people who grew up in a very conservative household and then suddenly saw like a reason video or went to a conference of ours. And then they see, okay, these are actually nice human beings who happen to believe in radical ideas about freedom and free markets and all of that stuff. And so they can come from all variety of ways. And also, of course, here it's, it's often connected to Ayn Rand and objectivism in the United States, not so much abroad. One of the issues that, so I was a campus coordinator for a young libertarians group now ugh, 20 years ago uh, on a college campus. And this was, of course, before well before Students for Liberty. And the, it was an extreme challenge to try to organize anything. This was also when the internet was fairly young, so it, was, it made it uh, that much more difficult. But one of the challenges that, you, that I think you probably face even today is that you have cohorts of students. They arrive on campus. They may be very active for you, and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. And in terms of maintaining that kind of trajectory and maintaining that kind of momentum to expand uh, and continue to spread the ideas of liberty, what, what, does that pose any specific unique challenge? 
I mean, this is the business that we're working in. So leadership transitions is part that also also every student learns uh, from us. Like each time you're building up a group or something, we said like, okay, one year before you graduate, you should think about like who's the next leader that you should like try to get in place and doing that. So we really try to teach that to our students. Does it always happen? No. Does it always succeed? No. But this is basically the the nature of the game that we are playing. And so you also have to offset, uh, offset that with uh, systematic outreach. And you were alluding to, and thank you for your services on, on the campus uh, back in the day, um, you were alluding to that um, it's, it's sometimes hard to find like other people. And so you have to do systematic outreach. And nowadays with the internet, that's much easier. So we are using not only Facebook graph search because everybody's using that, but we also doing this with in conjunction with sophisticated training, how to use these tools incentive structures, how to incentivize the students to do this systematically, and scripts, which helps them to get like more names and reaching out to more people, invite them to events, and tell them about the resources that we can offer them. Because one thing that we do, for instance, in this country is, okay, you're interested in free speech, um, please make the case to us that you can organize an event on your campus, uh, tell us about that, and then we send you resources. And then they can, can use that. And we find these people systematically. And they don't have to necessarily be a, a group which is just branded Students for Liberty. So we are also open for Young Americans for Liberty groups or Social for Sensible Drug Reform. We are like a loose network. As long as the people work towards a goal that we agree with, a goal towards liberty, then we are happy to help them. Is there much collaboration between SFL groups um, and then groups that are, let's say, not libertarian at all but might agree on a – specific issue. Um, I ask because there's – it often seems like there's this the, – the example I sometimes give is from back when the Snowden records came out um, and libertarians were kind of way out on in front on that one because we'd been you know talking about state surveillance for a while when other people weren't paying attention to it and we were some of the first to condemn it. And so a lot of say Cato scholars were in the news when this was coming out and there was this pushback on the left of, you know, don't get tricked by these libertarians. Like it may look like they're your friends on these issues, but really what they want to do is dismantle the welfare state or whatever else. So is there is there a concerted effort to reach out on, say, single issues where there's agreement with groups that are not libertarian? And is there problem getting them to work with to work together given the disagreement on the other issues? It depends on a case by case basis, I would say. So we are one of the, I think, few organizations who can actually build interesting coalitions because we are broad tent libertarian. We do not hide that. We want to have the objectivists within our leadership, but also people who believe in minimal government or in no government. And so we are very heterogeneous there. But we also try to build bridges to both the left and the right, as I've said. And we do that. So we are one of the few organizations where you can find just last year at the conference, you can find the NIA, the National Rifle Association, but you also can find the ACLU the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, so as an organization level, we really try to do that and uh, do it more. And very often they really thank us for being there. So recently we were in the protest for the travel bans and we were there and saying, of course, of course you need like some checks and balances in the system, but uh, you should not just ban refugees because this is a nation of, uh, of refugees. And um, of course there's also self-interest because like <laughs> I have a visa as well and I'm living here. Um, and people thanked us very often. That was the majority of responses were very positive. Thank you for being here. Thank you for standing up for that. But also some guy took like one of the books we had there, which was called The Morality of Capitalism, said like, is this for free? And we said, yes. And he took it and whipped it apart and threw it away. But that was that was like one guy. But mostly people were reacting very nicely and um, it works well, but it really depends on the on the group. And this is this is on the organization level. What groups do individually, it really differs. Some people have like a really an interest of having like concealed carry on campus or something, then they're working more with the right. But um, just at the University of Maryland, we had several events now with like hundreds of students where you have a variety of groups there. And the coalition is built by our leader, Ethan Pritchard is his name. He's reaching out to them and he's saying like, we have all of these different groups there from the left and the right. We want to talk about free speech. You will be missing out when you're not there. And then they're showing up and talk about one another and often it's the very first contact. Libertarianism often, you can, you can say there's the economic side of it and there's the um, social side, the social liberty side of it. Are students, do you notice that students are more or less interested in one versus the other? Do they seem to be care more about the social angle and less about the economic or the other way around? 
So one thought is that generally the younger generation is more socially liberal than the older generation. That's just not even in libertarian circles. It's just like statistically true for all different circles. And uh, we also see see that. But I would say that some people, of course, are interested in one issue over the other. But most of the people are still coming from the economic angle to the ideas. And when we recruit people, we really want to make sure that they have a firm understanding of the ideas. So we test also that. Like, what is the what is your favorite thinker? Or like, what is the book that influenced you the most so that we're getting at that? And economics is really the most important. And I would say, like, it's the backbone also. Like, I studied political economy and I uh, have to defend my dissertation next month. And so I believe this is really something that every student should understand. But of course, some people are, like, more interested in uh, marriage equality and some people are more in gun rights. But I really want to facilitate and continue to foster an environment where libertarians from both sides, from the left and the right, can feel themselves um, as part of a community. Because it is perfectly valid to be a libertarian but hold deeply conservative values. It's perfectly fine, as, you, as long as you don't want to have the, the state or the government impose your preference over others. And it's a very reasonable preference and not everyone wants to party and smoke pot and I don't consume drugs. I don't even drink alcohol all that much. And I think it's totally fine to be that. And we want to have a welcoming environment there. And we see this quite frequently that also younger conservative, like people with conservative values also join our leadership. Do we know much about how young people in the United States, members of Students for Liberty, how they voted in 2016? Of course, we had two of the most despised uh, candidates in uh, rec at least recent American history and uh, how they broke down? Um, I don't have any firm data on that. But when I talk to our students, it seems that most people were voting uh, for Gary Johnson. Sure. Like the libertarian alternative that they were basically appalled by both alternatives. And yeah, really didn't see that coming. And now we, we are living in a post-election world with uh, Donald Trump in the office. And it's certainly an interesting challenge because it's quite easy for a libertarian organization and libertarian students to stand up against Obama and criticize him. And we will continue to do the same thing with Donald Trump in office. Um, I was, we had an event here with like 90 people in our office here in Washington uh, during the inauguration week. And the message that I sent to people who were there is that it's, it really doesn't depend on the personalities. We have to stand for liberty. We have principles over expediency and Hayek taught us that. And we really have to adhere to that. So we twill, twill, uh, still try to reach out to the left and the right. And we will say that if Donald Trump is doing something that is beneficial for the economy or something that is very good for liberty, we will say, yes, that's good. And if he is wrong on something, then we should criticize him. I raise that specific question because I know several libertarians who describe themselves as libertarians who were ardent supporters of Donald Trump. And uh, I've struggled to understand exactly why. I mean, I talked to many people and for me as a European, it was first impossible to understand, but now I think I understand it much more. And I don't claim that I have a full picture, <laughs> first, first of all, but it seems to me that many people latch on on like one specific issue, for instance, the Supreme Court. And then they say, okay, Donald Trump would be so much better than Hillary. So it's always in comparison to Hillary. And people are very skeptical if she would have done anything good and people were very afraid of, of uh, her being in charge. And so they latch onto this one issue and then say, yeah, he would be much better on that and say like, Trump is my guy. And then maybe take it too far that they only look at this one issue, but on like em embrace him and all of his policies. Um, that's what I see very often when I talk to people at least. Trump's election appears to be a catastrophe in so many ways, um, but it's nice to try to pry out some silver linings in it. Um, do you think that there's a, a chance that the left, the the young people who were really excited by Obama um, and and a lot of them, a lot, I mean, there seemed to be an inexplicable excitement among many for Hillary that didn't seem to have anything to do with her at all. Um, her actual policy her actual, prescriptions. Yeah, there was some like platonic ideal of Hillary that they were <laughs> fans of instead. But it made it harder sometimes to ar to argue against you know the the state um, to to make our public choice arguments or our moral arguments because there was this exciting, well spoken, dashing guy in the White House who everyone loved. Um, there's so just do you think that there's an opportunity with Trump to reach out to particularly people on the left who might have been um, opposed to or very skeptical of libertarianism, but suddenly are maybe a little more willing to listen to our arguments about how you shouldn't invest a ton of power in these people? 
Yeah, that's certainly the argument that make, many of our students are making. So I hope that we can reach out more to them because after the election, the left imploded on campus and they could not, or in general, and they couldn't really deal with the, with, with the new reality. And we can say we told you so, but I, I don't think that that argument alone will be very effective. So uh, we need to show them like why the libertarian body of thought is in general much better in order to address some of the issues that they care about. And so libertarians have become like much better and much more diverse in what they're talking about. It's not only about economics, even though I think it's like very important that we understand all of that and that we talk about these thinkers, but it's also about minority rights and about like what is happening to black communities and what their concerns are and that we are taking these things seriously and that we engage with them and uh, talk about that more. And I see many libertarian organizations doing this more and more and we also do that and I think that is the right approach. So I hope that we will be successful at it but we, we have to wait some more time in order to see if the left is coming in huge ways into the libertarian movement. I certainly would like that. On that diversity, the libertarian movement has long had a reputation for being a bunch of white dudes. I guess what do the demographic breakdowns look like mm -hmm. for student groups now? So I'm very happy to report that at least on the female and male division, um, we are like much better. So very often at our events, we have like 40% women there. And I think it's also due because you address like many more topics and because we try to really have like a community which is not based on like anti-something, but like pro-something and being like more open to discussions about all kinds of different ideas. I think that certainly helps, but I think it's still mostly white people. And I've noticed this when I came when I came specifically to this country, and I found myself doing like a training, and there were like 250 libertarians in there, and also like conservative people, and there were four four black people, and only one of them was African American. The other people were from one from the Bermudas and the other two from Africa, and I was talking to them like for an hour or so, and was trying to figure out why, and I I realized that I didn't understand. The, some of the issues that, that they are facing and what they care about. Similarly, I went to like a donor event and there was only one black donor. There, there are not many people around them. I also talked with him for an hour, tried to understand like why he thinks that the black community is not hearing this message or is not attracted to this message. And at the end of the conversation, I also asked him like how many people, like how many white people like have asked you this question? And I'm not special by any way, but he said like you're the only one. And we're talking always about how do we get more women in the movement, but apparently this question we don't raise enough. So thank you for raising it um, and how we can change it. So we are right now working on actually a proposal, which I want to have like a staffer just focused on historical black colleges and universities and trying to engage with these communities more and bringing the libertarian message there and trying to get them more into our leadership because it's, it's, it's just very natural. Even even if you, let's say you are like a black person and you, you have read Mises and Hayek and Rand and you're like super excited about that and then you see like a group of 100 people, only white people talking about their ideas, would you go there? You don't know if you're allowed in that club, right? And it's, it, it's just like very natural. And so we would really try to make an effort in order to, to bridge that more and try to speak to that community more. But we first have to understand like how do they see capitalism? Why do they see it negatively? Why do they believe more in the government if that's really the, the, the place and all of these sorts of things? Have you come to any conclusions about that? I mean, I've only had a couple of conversations. So I'm still very ignorant and I still have to learn much more. And that I, I want to be very clear on that. But what I, what, from what I've heard is that A, capitalism is very much connected as a system to slavery. That's part of it. It is also the belief that federalism is very good for black communities because they believe that Jim Crow got like the federal government stepped in and got rid of Jim Crow. They don't know that like most politicians back in that day, back in the day, were really a bunch against that. And that even like the president had like close to like a nervous breakdown because he didn't want to pass that law. And so it's basically the trust in the federal government to step in and to improve, situ in, 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 to improve the situation. Um, I think that is like another piece of the puzzle because they see the states as problems because police is state, but they think that the federal government might be able to help. But capitalism in itself is very much connected to colonialism and to slavery. And so... We have to address that. We have to learn more about that. We have to learn more about the thinker that are behind these arguments and then address it head on um, and try to reach out more. But it's not that uncommon for young people to believe that kicking a debate or kicking a decision-making power from the local level to a higher level of government is going to result in some sort of more responsible decision. Yeah. Fortunately, it's the, uh, it's the opposite. So uh, libertarians really embrace decentralization and uh, more power on the ground. And that might be like another argument that they see, oh, if we would give like, more power to the local corps or something, then they would be even more tyrannical. 
But uh, we also research from Elinor Ostrom has shown that, that that is not very true because if you have like more local com uh, police who is in the community who comes from the community, there's like so much more interactions between them and it's, it's like much more peaceful than if you had like the state governing everything and like as people you don't know is policing your area and interacting with, with your crowd in a wrong way. So if I'm, you know, if I'm one of those people who's being questioned and someone's telling, you know, so what is this libertarianism thing? Are there arguments that you see or or ways of presenting it that you see young libertarians, people new to libertarianism make that you think are particularly ineffective that you wish they'd stop? Um, and then and then ones that you think, you know, you wish they'd make more of that sort of either argument or description of libertarianism or just way of presenting it. That goes back to the whole persuasion thing and what is like the best arguments. And so one part is that you first have to understand what the other party really cares about because if you just come up with your best arguments independent of what the other person cares about, then that will not be very effective. That's one part. The other part is that I think we have to be careful with moral arguments. I think we both have to make the moral case as well as the utilitarian case or like why freedom is important and freedom of the world index and all that stuff. But with the morality, we should be careful. And I think that is the mistake that I've made and what I see many young people are doing that they just think, okay, whatever the government does is evil. Therefore, if you advocate for policy X, you are evil. And that is like, it's a sledgehammer approach where, where there's no way out for the other party to really engage in the conversation. Like, where do you go from there? And I mean, we should make the moral argument and we should point out that the government and all their policies will finally end up in some sort of violence against people. And we should try to make that case, but we should not. We should be careful in leading people to that because it's such a radical, different view that they have never heard um, that one should have a gradual approach starting with what the other person cares about first. That would be my, my general advice. But so I shouldn't just shout taxation is theft at people? Maybe not, no. Or just loudly call them a statist? Yeah. Does that? Uh, yeah. It that seems to work okay. You're thinking don't or don't do that? No, no, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> and that's also why we try to, to brand us differently. So we have slogans, for instance, it says like t-shirts and people love it. It says peace, love, liberty. That's what it's about, right? Stop bombing people. It's about respecting other people, love them like your neighbor. Because like libertarian is like libertarianism is the only ideology which really trusts people. Because if you talk to the, both the left and the right, if it really goes down to something, why they want to impose their worldview is because they think that people are stupid. Because they think they cannot govern themselves. We believe that people can actually do that. And the other slogan is don't tweet on anyone. It's not only about me, 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 me. It's not about like like this isolated individualism, but it's about don't tweet on anyone. It's also about other people. And that is something that we also have to go against on campus because most people, when they hear libertarianism, it's things like the radical, uh, we are just like radi radical individualists who just want to fight for ourselves and just build like the empire and, and screw everyone else. But no, we understand the value of community. We understand that complex social problems have to be addressed by complex institutions, which are built of many, many people. We know that that we have social needs. As much as we have the need for food, we have the need for acceptance of others. And once you understand that and like learn a little bit about evolutionary psychology, then you know that this is not true for libertarians and we have to also um, make the case for that. That seems like it presents a particularly good opportunity for libertarians in the coming four to eight years where you have uh, you know, a broadly uh, right wing, for lack of a better term, anti-immigrant, anti-trade uh, uh, push, and on the other side, sort of a would-be totalitarian anti-speech, uh, anti uh, anti-fascism is what the, what a lot of these groups call themselves, mm. who seem every bit as scary as the other side. Yeah, I think what we can really do differently is that we should stress more the positive aspects of our ideology. Because we get all teary-eyed if we read I pencil, right? But why? Because we marvel at the market, and that's the word that Hayek used in his essay, The Use of Knowledge in Society. The price system is a marvel. If we can get this exciting to, excitement to other people, like look at a supermarket and think about the thousands of thousands of people behind that, how is it possible that this most boring item, like the tomato soup, is still interesting is still there is is I can eat that and I don't die like how is that even possible think about it like this sort of excitement and the positivity of the ideology also talking about not only that we have erased poverty from I think absolute poverty poverty was in 19 
90 around 37 percent now it is at low, like since 2015 less than 10 percent like also explaining what this means like just think about all these data points all these individuals who used to work like themselves to death and only lived until 40 years old now they have a family they have more options whole countries like china and india suddenly they can get like much better education much better health care have these countries still problems sure are we in a perfect society no um is the world perfect no but look at all of these positive developments and say like this is why i believe classical liberalism and libertarian ideas are so important and excite other people for that i think that is a message that people should hear more and that's independent of who is in charge because there's so much negativity out there. The left is hating the, the right. The, the country is really divided. And we see this in this country, many other countries as well. And if we had like a positive message, which is like more uniting and not only complaining about all the things that are going wrong, I think that really resonates with people. So this week, as we record this, you guys have got this weekend, you've got a pretty cool event going on here in D.C. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, that is our 10th year anniversary of the International Students for Liberty Conference. So... Over a thousand people have um, registered and then tons of partner organization and the Cato Institute is one of our main sponsors, of course, uh, coming there. So we expect like 1,500 people who are celebrating with us liberty. It's an event where people talk about all kinds of topics, from about foreign policy, about drug reform to prison reform and all kinds of other things. And we have great speakers there. When Paul is going to be there, Steve Forbes is going to be there, uh, Amir Nasser is going to be there, who is a refugee actually, um, who is in Canada right now, who cannot travel to us because of the travel ban, <laughs> uh, which is very unfortunate. Uh, he is going to speak there about um, his topic about how liberty can actually help to argue against some radical forms of Islam, which he experienced when he grew up in the country of Sudan. And so there's a whole variety of, of speakers there. And also, it's not only for, for students, because last year alone, there were 50% of the attendees were non-students. So it's really like a movement event and people interested in the ideas, old and young. There is a conspiracy theory uh, that I've heard uh, from multiple sources about Students for Liberty. Right. And it goes something like this. You hold your annual international conference around Valentine's Day, and we're recording this on Valentine's Day, also the birthday of Frederick Douglass. Um, and it is uh, the idea is that you're trying to actively make more libertarians by holding it this close to Valentine's Day. Uh, I see. I guess like the people who are coming up with the conspiracy theories are smarter than we are, but it's actually a good idea. So that that we are going to grow as a movement more just by okay, I, I see where you're going with that. Um, I don't think that is really uh, conscious that we made that decision, but it cannot definitely harm. And we know that, for instance, <laughs> Alexander McCobin found his wife through the organization, and we have many of these cases. So there is uh, love to be found in the ideas, and I think Valentine's idea. I think it's wonderful that we um, record it on this day because. We all have a love for liberty here in this building, especially at the Cato Institute, and we should be more open about that. So maybe we can expect to see a Tinder for libertarians from you guys? I don't know. We, had, we do have quite a few um, entrepreneurs in, among our ranks, and many people start businesses. So that might be one of those projects that uh, maybe we see out of coming out of Students for Liberty soon, which is exciting. Um, and just one, one more note. So people can go to www.isflc.org um, and can check it out and hopefully register. And I would love to see you there. And um, on the topic of alumni, also, it's, it's very uplifting because it's like one part of our work is empowering students on campus to learn more and to become better leaders. But all of these people then follow their own career. And that's really our theory of social change, which is based on Hayek's intellectuals and socialism. Because we do not only need people on the hill who are affecting change. Because if the ideas in society didn't change, then everything will be reverted just in the next period. We need journalists. We need people like you here in the think tank world. We need media folks. We need journalists. And we have now many, many success stories of people who have started businesses or we have founded over 18 nonprofits right now in the United States and abroad who are now working with the Atlas Network and other organizations and affecting change that way as well. And that's really exciting to see because it's not only about the leaders today, but also the leaders of the future and those we are trying to create. What do libertarians not study enough in school? Libertarians? Yes. What should libertarians be studying that they typically don't? Aaron, Aaron made reference to uh, understanding the arguments of your opponents, but in terms of deeply understanding a, a body of thought, uh, what should they be studying? Hmm. First, I, I, I heard your question differently and I said like nobody is studying libertarianism in school and so they don't become libertarians in the first place. Um, 
But I would say, and this is uh, close to my heart, it's probably psychology and specifically political psychology. So I'm a fan of Jonathan Haidt's work. He's also going to speak at our conference, actually. And uh, his book, The Righteous Mind, is a fantastic read. I recommend it to your listeners uh, very much because it, and I'm, I'm sure he would be mad at me if I summarize it that way, but he basically summarizes how smart human beings can really become very irrational when talking about politics. And this is something very deeply ingrained with us because the ideas that we have, we identify with them. They are part of us. And if somebody is arguing against those ideas and undermines them, which sometimes happens, it is somewhat like as a personal attack against us. And that can lead all kinds to, to all kinds of different responses that would that are inappropriate. That's one point. And it's also about emotional intelligence, actually understanding how other people think, trying to be empathetic, trying to really be open about what, what's going on because we are putting our students in very difficult situations where they speak in front of hundreds of people. This is nerve-wracking. Maybe they think they're imposters. I certainly felt that. I, I was very intimidated when I was be around all these leaders like Alexander McCobin and others. And if we address that more and if we understand more of this thinking, then we can become more productive ourselves, better leaders ourselves, and can speak more effective to people who are not libertarians. So you're in your first six months as CEO of Students for Liberty um, and I'm sure you have big plans for the organization. So what do you see in the future of Students for Liberty and, and the libertarian student movement more generally? To answer your first question, uh, first, we are currently working through an extensive process of creating a vision document for the next five years. And it has been very productive and we involve volunteers and all kinds of staffers all around the world because we have 41 staff members. And it has been very fruitful. So three pillars we will focus on as an organization is the community aspect, being like the reaching out to ever more people, but also being like the kind and reasonable alternative, even though with radical ideas alternative on campus. The second thing is like really improving our training because we have trained just last year or this year, so it's only in our fiscal year nine months in, over 2,000 people. We want to have more impact, but we also want to really be the go-to libertarian organization for young people so that they can learn more, become better leaders. So increasing our pipeline. So we now have, for instance, also like top 100 retreats where the top volunteers in the region, for instance, Europe or America, then come all together and, and train one another and get trained from others for like three days in different leadership principles. And the third thing, which I'm also very excited about, is about incubate. Because many of our students come up with unique projects. We have people, for instance, in France, Ukraine, and Vienna, and some people working also in the United States, who have started a startup incubator, helping businesses get started, working with big companies together, but also teaching why a free society and a free market is necessary for that. That's not something we could have come up with, but they were just pursuing that and were very able to, to pull it off. We also had like an event where there was a massive concert. It was like 2,000 people. It was a festival, but they also had... Um, speakers like Tom Palmer there. So having part cultural stuff, but also part partly um, libertarian topics. So really focusing on these students who are doing unique things and helping them, setting them up with a network, giving them specific training. Um, I think that would be also uh, very interesting. And so that they also have at some point like a top 50 retweet where we bring all the best leaders, like the people you, you mentioned, like Fabio Ostermann from Brazil, talking to our American leaders, talking to our European leaders, and then they can really engage in, in high level knowledge sharing and really continue to change the world in the future. That's one part. And the other part is that we see so many of our alumni now starting businesses and engaging in nonprofits and becoming academics and really continue to have a change for the ideas that we all embrace here in this room. And that's just very wonderful to see. For libertarianism in, in, in general, I mean, I'm, I'm very optimistic because I'm looking at our organization and I see so many good organizations like the Cato Institute, Institute, Institute for Main Studies doing tremendous work. And I, I think it has a huge effect and libertarians as a group have been growing. And I don't think that 10 years ago you could envision that we have a conference like this here in DC where 1,500 people will show up. So I'm optimistic about that. Will this translate into change in the short term? I don't know. I'm, I'm more skeptical about the short run, but very optimistic about in the long run. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.